Can you imagine a, a community where everybody spoke truth all the time? A community where there was no lying, no half lies, no white lies, no deception, no flattery. But when people spoke to you, you just took them at their word. That, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Imagine a community where there is forgiveness, I mean genuine forgiveness. So when you've wronged somebody and you genuinely repent and they say the words, I forgive you, they actually mean it. A community where there's no grudges, no holding on to past wrongs, where no silent treatment. That'd be beautiful, wouldn't it? Or a community where there's kindness and compassion. A community where you really see needs and feel needs. A community where you pour yourself out for other people and so you want to just bless and bless and bless and bless and bless. Well, imagine a community where those who have much share with those who have little. A community where there's never hatred, abuse, violence. A community where we, we actually care about the marginalized and the oppressed and the needy, where we, we feel the injustice of this world. I'd love to be part of that community. I'd love to be part of that community that is, is so different to the world because the world is all about self and pride and lies and grudges and gossiping and loneliness. And to be part of a community where there is kindness and compassion and faithfulness and forgiveness and, and love, it would, be, it would be amazing, wouldn't it? Who wouldn't, be, who wouldn't want to be part of that? And our question this morning is, is, where do you find that kind of community? Where do you find a community that is loving and truthful and faithful and forgiving and kind and compassionate? And of course the answer is the church. The church, the people of God who gather together, we're supposed to be this community that are full of kindness and compassion and forgiveness and truth. We're supposed to be the church. So when people look at the church, they go, oh, wow, that's Jesus. Now, our slogan as a church is, is living for Jesus and loving like Jesus. It is on our notice boards, it's on our, on our website, it's on every single form of communication. We're a church living for Jesus and loving like Jesus. We, we claim to be a people who are living under the Lordship of Christ, so every area of our life is honouring to Jesus and pleasing to Jesus. And we're claiming to be a church that's loving like Jesus. So loving all people within the church and outside the church like Jesus would love them. With this extravagant, unconditional, non-judgmental love. And so living for Jesus and loving like Jesus is not just a, a statement of belief, it's a declaration of behavior. It's not just about the content, it's, it's about our character. We are saying, look at us, look at this church, and you should see Jesus. By the way that we relate, by the, the things that we say, the, the way that we treat people, you should see Jesus in us. Because our world out there is desperate for a community that actually practices what they preach. That they're desperate to have a bunch of people who, who, who speak truth and not lies, who, who forgive and don't hold on to hurts. They're desperate for the church to actually be the hands and feet of Jesus. Now, there's a danger with this morning's sermon. The danger is that, that as we go through these verses that you just hear, do this and don't do this, start this and stop this, and, and change your behavior and try harder and do better. And those types of sermons are just exhausting because you leave here feeling burdened or feeling a failure or you're feeling self-righteous and a bit of a Pharisee. 
You've got to remember that Ephesians 4 is all about the new you. We heard last week that, that if you're in Christ, the old has gone and the new has come. You're not the person that you once were. You are different. God has changed you. I remember when I became a Christian, one of my closest friends was overseas at the time, and he was overseas for two years, and he came back two years later, and we went for a beer at the pub, and he said, Paul, you have changed. You are so different. And he didn't mean that as a compliment. But to me, it was a compliment. Because God had changed me. My speech was different. My attitude was different. Everything that I prioritized was different. I was a different person. And he could see that. And people should see us, see you, and say, you are different. So please don't hear this as things to do. It's just who you are in Christ. We are different, so live differently. Live out who you already are in Christ. And this morning we're going to look at five areas of life, and it's mainly to do with our language, with our words. The way we talk to each other and the way we talk about each other. And our first one is this truthful speech. So in verse 25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Just to be clear, the NIV is not particularly helpful. That The tense is not actually put off. It's not an imperative, do this, do this, do this. The tense is having had put off falsehood, having put away your falsehood. He says, falsehood is not who you are anymore. Because you're in Jesus, you don't lie anymore. You don't deceive anymore. That's not who you are anymore. Having put off falsehood, you know, you're in Jesus, so you now speak truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Because Jesus is truth, chapter 4, verse 21. It, no deceit was in his mouth, and he, he never lied. And now you belong to Jesus, so you speak like Jesus spoke. And I want to say there, there's no place for falsehood in God's church. And I'm not just talking about blatant lies. There's no place for white lies or half-truths in this church. There's no place for cover-up in this church. There's no place for telling my version of my story <laughs> so I manipulate you to take my side in an argument. There should be no deceit here so we should never say one thing to your face and another behind your back. There's no place here for holding back information to give wrong impression. Right? We're good at that, you know. Paint your side of the story and leave out all the key facts. There's no place for flattery here, so we butter you up to get what we want. No exaggeration, no embellishments, that's a temptation of mine. No sweeping, generalized statements like, you always do that or you never do that. None of that here, because falsehood is the domain of Satan. He is the father of life, and we don't belong to Satan, we belong to Jesus. And I love verse 25, because he doesn't just say, stop lying. He says, speak truth. He doesn't say, we don't lie here. He says, we tell people the truth here. We, we're honest people. We're, we're people who are truthful with our words. We, we say what we saw, we say what we did, and we say how we feel. And we tell people the truth about God and sin and salvation. That's who we are. Someone said this, it's, it's, it's as unthinkable for one Christian to lie to another Christian as it would be for a nerve in the body to deliberately send a false message to the brain. Or for the eye to deceive the rest of the body when danger is approaching. The life of a Christian becomes a libel rather than the Bible when he stoops to any form of tampering with truthfulness. And I love that Paul starts with truth. Because this was one of the first areas of my personal life that Jesus radically transformed when I met Jesus. Because I've shared before, I, I grew up in a, a family of liars, a household of lies. 
Uh, as a kid, we were told, tell this person this thing and that person that thing, and they can't know that, and they can't know that. And they're this, this spinning this web of deception and lies, and it was exhausting. And you never know who you can trust. And the scary thing is that when you start to live that kind of deceitful life, it, you begin to believe your own lies. Not just telling lies, it, we were told never to actually tell people how you really feel. And that's why I'm passionate about truth at the Bridge Church. I can't stand deception. I can't stand cover-ups. I can't stand manipulation or gaslighting or ghosting. And what did Jesus say? Out of the overflow of your heart, out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. I can't see your heart, but I can hear your words. So we're a community marked by truth because, verse 25, we are members of one body. So, so Jesus is the head, we are the body. And so when we lie and when we speak falsehood, we don't just hurt Jesus, we hurt each other. It causes division and disunity in God's church. So I'd love this to be a church marked by honesty, truthfulness, integrity. But we don't need to hide things. Calvin said, lying is a monstrosity. So, Bridges, will we do everything we can to be known for truthfulness? That'd be beautiful. Number two, righteous anger. This might shock you, righteous anger. Look at verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Uh, literally, it says, be angry, but don't sin. Be angry, but don't sin. He's not commanding us to be angry all the time. This is not an imperative. It's actually a quote from Psalm 4 where, where David is facing unjust opposition. And, and David is being criticized unjustly and being slandered unjustly. And it was so unjust, he gets rightly angry. This may shock you, but anger is not always wrong. It's okay to be righteously angry as long as it is righteous, not just a flying off the handle. Because God gets angry. God is righteously angry. When, when God sees injustice and abuse and cruelty, he's rightly angry. When God sees his beloved children, the people of God, wandering and worshipping idols, he's rightly angry. And, and Jesus was rightly angry. Remember, he walked into the temple and saw those money changers, and he, he turned at the table and says, How dare you turn my father's house into den of robbers? When... when when religious people stop people from worshipping God and encountering we should be rightly angry. I'd argue there's a great need for righteous anger in God's church. We need more people like John Wesley who was rightly angry at his personal sin. We need more Wilberforces who are rightly angry angry at injustice in society and will speak up for slave trade and sex trade and drug trade and the treatment of refugees. We need more Martin Luther's who will get rightly angry at doctrinal sin. When, when, when churches deny the deity of Jesus or the cross of Christ, we should be rightly angry at that. Let me ask you, do you get angry when you see injustice in the world? When you hear that one in four, one in four kids in poor countries are currently enslaved into forced labor, that makes me angry. When I hear about poverty, that makes me angry. Where there's more than enough food to go around, but people are starving as we sit here with our affluence. Or the billion kids aged 2 to 17 who've experienced physical, sexual, or emotional violence in the past year alone. That makes me angry. Or the one in four women in Australia who face domestic violence. That makes me rightly angry. Or the, Every single week in New South, Wales, New South Wales, somebody is murdered. That makes me rightly angry. And when churches do nothing about poverty or social justice, that makes me angry. When we do nothing about violence and abuse, that makes me angry. When we hear about the 2,000 people who lost their lives this week in the landslide in Papua New Guinea, and we hear so little about it. 
We hear everything about these four billionaires who lost their lives in a submarine, but we hear nothing about these people who were killed in a landslide. That makes me angry. But what really makes me angry is when pastors lead their, lead their flocks astray. <laughs> when pastors come up sin and they just cause Christians to walk towards them. There is such a thing as righteous anger when God's name is blind. When God's name is dishonored, it's right to feel anger. But let's be honest, most time our anger is, anger is not that kind of anger. Most time our anger is just this, this rage and this flying off the handle because we personally have been hurt. We shout and we abuse to get things off our chest because it makes us feel better. That's not the kind of anger he's talking about here. Our churches need to be marked by righteous anger, not a, a rage like the world. Please, unrestrained anger that leads to retaliation and revenge and verbal abuse and slander in this explosive act, but it's not pleasing this church. Or unchecked anger that leads to bitterness and moodiness and meanness and hatred, not in this church, please. I love this quote. Our sinful self-righteousness is likely to lead us to this subtle temptation to regard my anger as righteous and indignant and other people's anger is sheer bad temper. So if we're in Christ, we don't live in this unrighteous anger, we live in righteous anger. And we deal with disagreements quickly, verse 26, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, he says. We love to quote this verse for marriage couples. But it's true for all of us. If, if you're in a fight and a disagreement, please, 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 do everything you can to resolve it. He's not saying you will resolve it before sundown, but he's saying don't nurse anger. Don't allow anger to, to linger in your heart. If you're mad at something, deal with it. Because of verse 27, do not give the devil a foothold. Literally there is a, a foot in the door. He's saying anger in God's church, unrighteous anger in God's church, is a feeding ground for Satan. You know, Satan doesn't want people to become Christians. He doesn't want the word to go out. He doesn't want Christ to be magnified. And so what does he do? He doesn't need to target doctrine. He just targets relationships. If we can hold fighting and factions and grudges and hurts here, the devil will love that. Unrighteous anger in God's church is deadly, it is devilish, and it's damaging. D.R. Moody, the famous evangelist, once was on a mission at a church and he was there to speak for a whole week and after day five, nothing had happened. He said, there's no power in the meetings. On the last day, he said this, perhaps there is some pent up anger in this church that I'm not aware of. And at that point, the chair of the mission committee got up and stormed out because he'd been hurt and wronged and was harboring anger in his heart. And so he graciously found the man he was angry with and asked for forgiveness and went back to Moody and said, thank God for you coming here. And on the last night when the anger had been dealt with, the church was packed and thousands gave their life to Christ. Anger in God's church will stop the growth of the gospel. So truthful speech, righteous anger, Number three, generous work. I was tempted to ignore verse 28 because it's not about words, it's about work. But I do think it's important for our church. Uh, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. He's saying, if, if you're in Christ, the old is gone. Your old self was lazy, you sponged off people, your old self was entitled, you felt like you were entitled to all this stuff from other people and you took advantage of people. Your old self was like a thief that took sick days and long lunches and conference junkies are off to the subtle way that we steal from God, but that's not you anymore. 
You're in Jesus, you're workers, and you're hard workers, and you're honest workers, and you work hard for the Lord, and you, you pour yourself out for other people. But look at the motivation, verse 28. That they may have something to share with those in need. That's the motivation, that, that we work hard so we can be generous. We work hard not so we can buy bigger houses and faster cars, but so we can give and give and give and give again. We work hard so we can give to brothers and sisters in need. We work hard so we can live out love. We work hard so we're known as a church, not just that does organize food drive. I mean, this is an easy bag of hope. You know, feel good about yourself by doing an extra bag of shopping at Woolies. Now, we're known as a church where we secretly and spontaneously, we're just generous. We work and we work and we work so we can give and we can give and we can give. We can give. Wesley said, make as much as you can and give as much as you can. I'd love us to be a church like that. So we speak truthfully. We are righteously angry. We work to be generous. Number four, we have edifying words. Ruby, verse, verse 29. Do not let, let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do you ever wish there were some words that were not in the Bible? I wish the word any and only were not in that verse. You know, if he said to me, don't let some unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, I could cope with that. But any? And if he'd said but mainly what's helpful for building others up, but it's okay to build yourself up as well. I could cope with that. But he's saying every word that comes out of your mouth should be edifying, should be building up, not tearing down. Every word that comes out of your mouth must be about the other person, not about you. The word for unwholesome there is actually the word corrupting or rotten. It's, used, it's the word used by uh, Jesus in Mark's Gospel. Where he talks about rotten fruit or rotten fish moldy fruit and rotten fish you, know, you wouldn't give rotten food to people so why do you give rotten words to people he's saying if you're in Christ you, you, your, your mouth is different there, there's no gossip you, you never hear in church have you heard about so and so and you never hear in church slanderous comments or I hate it when you do that that's not on our vocab here there's no sarcasm in like oh yeah right as if you're really going to do that no obscenities no put downs what's, what's that kids rhyme that we have sticks and stones can break my bones but words can never hurt you it's utter nonsense isn't it I mean sticks and stones break your bone but bones heal after, after about six weeks but but words, words damage and destroy people. There are people here, including myself, who have been shaped negatively by words that were spoken to us and about us, often by people in power and authority. And we are so damaged by them And we need to be very, very careful with the words that we speak here because you know the power of words. Harsh words will crush people and hurtful words will cut people to the core. I want this to be a church that is known for words of comfort and words of encouragement and words of praise. Not a place of bitching and gossip and lying and anger and pride because we're in Christ. And so our, our words are edifying. They, they look like we're build up, not tear down. Lift up, not crush. Encourage, not diminish. We're here to speak words like Jesus would speak. He would say, I'm so thankful for you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so kind. You're so caring. Wow, what a gift you've got. Praise God for your gift. I see God's Spirit so powerfully at work in you. Don't be part of that community where... Where Jesus would say to us, well done. Or Jesus would say, no, just believe, just trust. Are you a little faith? 
want to be a community where we, we speak words of wisdom and counsel. We, we, we quote scriptures at each other, not, not bashing people with the Bible, but encouraging, building up. I want to be a church where we speak kind, caring words. Are you okay? How can I help you? Is there anything you need right now? A, a church where we empower, not find fault or criticize or put down. Billy Graham said this, Christians, please guard your tongue. Use it for good, not evil. How many marriages, friendships have been destroyed because of criticism that spiraled out of control? How many relationships have broken down because of a word spoken thoughtlessly or in anger? A harsh word cannot be taken back. No apology can fully repair its damage. So here at the bridge, just please think about what you say, how you say it, why you say it. Think about what you say. Use kind words, thoughtful words, gentle words, encouraging words, clarifying words. But please think about what not to say. Sometimes we need to just bite our tongue. Sometimes not saying it is the best thing. Don't write that email. Don't send that text. Because once it's said, you can't take it back. Think about how you say it, your tone, your pitch, your volume, your facial expression. Think about when you say it. Late at night is rarely a good idea. When someone's about to preach or teach it is often not a good idea. Now think about why you say it. Look at the verse. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, it may benefit them. That's our motivation. Is it good for them? Will it build them up? Because it's not about you. I've learned over the years to do the helpful for others test. The helpful for others test. Will it be helpful for them? Because it might make me feel better. But it's not about me. It's about them. And I love the motivation in verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Uh, grief is a personal word because God is a person. The Spirit of God who lives inside of you is sad, is pained, is heard when we speak harsh words. When we speak harshly and unkindly, God is sad. When we as a church lie or fight or cover up, God is hurt. When you put down your brother with your word, God is hurt. It's like being a parent, isn't it? Like when your, parent, when your kids do the wrong thing, you grieve that. You don't cut them off. You don't destroy the relationship. They're still your child. But you feel sadness. That's how God feels. So our words as a church must make the Spirit of God glad, not sad. The way we speak to each other and about each other will make the spirit glad, not sad. And then lastly this morning, gracious hearts. He finished with a bang in verse 31. Uh, get rid of all bitterness. All, again, see it? All bitterness. All rage, all anger, all brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Get rid of it all. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And again, the tense is not particularly helpful in the NIV. It's in the passive voice. So it's not a command to get rid of bitterness. He's not saying, do this, do this, do this. He says, having got rid of bitterness. Because when you met Christ, he got rid of your bitterness. And he got rid of your rage. He got rid of your anger. Now, it's still your old self is there. It's bubbling away. But you've got to fight it. But it's not who you are anymore. You're not a bitter person anymore. You're not an angry person anymore because you're in Christ. The business is ugly, that, that, that smouldering under the surface that can be triggered and rage is ugly and brawling is ugly and malice is ugly. Can you, can you imagine a church? Can you imagine a church full of, of people who are angry and silently harboring hurts and grudges and screaming behind closed doors and slandering each other, all smiles on Sundays but slandering each other. Can you imagine that kind of church? Well, actually, sadly... You probably don't need to imagine too hard because that's what lots of churches are like. It's not who we are, is it? Please. Please, it's not who we want to be as a church, is it? 
They want to be known as people who are kind and compassionate. They are kind to each other, so it's that beautiful heart where you reach out and you offer support gently and compassionate, where you, you have this gut-wrenching love and, 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 and affection and feelings for, towards each other. When you see someone in pain, it hurts you. And yes, we forgive each other because we have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, how much has God forgiven you in Christ? How much has God forgiven you personally in Jesus Christ? And the answer is he's forgiven you everything, past, present, and future. He has forgiven you the most extraordinary, abundant forgiveness. And if you claim to be, be in Christ, we're called to forgive other people. How many times? Seven times? Seventy-seven times, says Jesus. I'm not saying you are reconciled. I'm not saying that you have to trust them or put yourself in harm's way, but you don't hold on to lack of forgiveness. As C.S. Lewis says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. So, Bridges, this is who we are in Jesus. We are people who speak truthfully, who have righteous anger. We are generous with our work. We're edifying with our words, and we're gracious with our hearts. I want to encourage each person here this morning just to take some time today, just to sit down and to maybe with somebody who knows you well and say, which of these five things do I really need to work on? Am I making the spirit glad or sad in these areas? But please remember, this is not a moral list. This is not a try harder, change your behavior. This is just get to know Jesus better. Because the more you get to know Jesus, the more you dwell in Jesus, the more you'll be like Jesus. And Jesus was a man who spoke the truth, who was righteously angry, who used his words to build up, not tear down, and was gracious upon gracious upon gracious. So yeah, I want this church to be a church full of truth and forgiveness and kindness and generosity, compassion and love. Can you imagine that? I hope you can. I hope you can. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that when you walked on earth, your words were true. Your heart was kind. You were rightly angry at the injustice in this world. And you forgave us. And you forgive us again and again and again. Lord, help us to be your church. Help people to see Jesus in us and through us, please. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take communion together as a reminder of who we are in Christ.